Hello, everyone. I hope that I pressed the right button and this is broadcasting. So if not, well, then I'm just talking to Jake and Kevin. Hi, everyone. My name is Sherry Suarez Foreman. I'm the Director of Development for AD Players, and I want to welcome all of you here uh, with us tonight. We're so excited about um, our first ever Story Start Here conversation. Um, so before we get started, I want to go ahead and get through uh, some housekeeping. Um, there's Jake, there's Kevin, say hi to them. Um, but hi. Hold on, let me get through some housekeeping. Um, so uh, as we are going through this evening, um, we're gonna, we're, the agenda for the evening is gonna be 20 minutes of kind of talking about our virtual gala and re rethinking that. Uh, the second 20 minutes, we're gonna be talking about our season and how we pivoted and, uh, and really changed up our, our 20, 20, 2021 season. And then the last 20 minutes we're going to reserve for Q&A. And so if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A uh, button feature. You can press that and go ahead and type in throughout the conversation any questions you may, might have. And the development team, Stephen, Shelby, and Morgan, they're all on this webinar as well. And they're going to be texting me your questions. And so I want to make sure that everyone has their questions answered by the end of, of today. Um, so uh, also at the very end of the survey, you're going to be getting, I mean, at the end of the conversation, you're going to be getting a survey. And if you'll complete that, we want to find out about any topics you are interested in hearing uh, about over the next uh, six to nine months. We have a couple planned uh, in November, December, but after that we don't. So uh, send us your ideas and your topics and, and we are excited to share um, these conversations with you. So. Without any further ado, I would like to uh, welcome two of my very favorite people, for real, um, Jake Speck, Executive Director of AD Players, and Kevin Dean, Artistic Director of AD Players. Hey, guys. Hello. How Sherry are you? is definitely in my top 50 favorite. <laughs> yeah, I'm in the top 50. He's, at, he's in my top 100, so, but kidding, totally kidding. one of my favorite 100 people. You too, Kevin. Save a hundred people. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about, um, so th this has been a year of so many firsts. The first time the George Theater has been dark for over six months. Uh, the first time we actually uh, figured out how to produce a live streamed virtual gala, and it was fun. Um, you know, the first time we've started our season with something other than um, a, a, a play and, um, and so many things have happened. And so, uh, and, and I can tell you that over the past months, we've had many, many conversations about all of these uh, uh, topics of, of uh, interest and we, about the season and about the gala. And so uh, we thought that you really would be interested in, in kind of uh, finding out what was going on behind the scenes. So Jake, we're gonna start with you. So Jake, um, if you want to, this is kind of general and broad. I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh, to Jake. And then as you have questions, if you want to text, uh, send them to, uh, in the Q&A uh, tool, we will, um, I'll be reading these from here and hopefully you all send us lots of questions. So Jake, walk us through from March 13th, when the week before uh, we were to have our, our third annual after dinner affair, um, until we actually had our live stream virtual gala from the George uh, in August. Walk us through that. Okay, well, I'll try not to be too long winded, but um, <laughs> you know, this was right at the beginning of the pandemic and it was very uncertain. Nobody really knew what the virus was, how dangerous it was. And so it was definitely, it was on our radar as we were talking about it, but we were still moving forward because major events were still moving forward. The Houston rodeo was still moving forward. Um, and then when the rodeo canceled, then I just started kind of, we started panicking a little bit. We got noticed that it was going to get canceled. We were having a gala planning meeting. Mm -hmm. Everybody in there started getting these texts about, you know, they're going to cancel the rodeo. They're going to cancel the rodeo. And, so and I kept saying, no way, no way, no way, no way. At that point, we were like, all right, well, at this point, we're, we are going to look incredibly irresponsible if we don't postpone this thing. And it had become clear with the virus at that point that we would be incredibly irresponsible if we didn't, if we didn't cancel or postpone. So we made the decision at the time just to postpone till August 15th. 
because in the beginning of March, that seemed like a very reasonable date by which we'd be able to have a full crowd in the theater again. Um, little did we know. Um, so, I mean, it was pretty early on. I got to give Sherry credit. Sherry was in my ear about turning this into a virtual event very early on. And I was like, no, we're not doing that. It's going to be fine in August. We're going to do the full, it's not going to have the same effect virtually. We're not going to do that. Well, as it got closer and closer and, and Sherry was more insistent that we look into this idea of a virtual gala, we really started looking hard at it. And um, we were able to consult uh, other places that had done it. We watched a lot of really, really bad virtual galas for um, other performing arts organizations, organizations and other nonprofits that shall remain nameless. We saw some that were done really well and some that were just not done well at all. And um, it, became, it became clear that it was the right choice for us to go virtual. I think one of the things that was working in our favor was that it was so far into it. It was come August where we had figured out a safe way to at least get some performers back into the theater, if not a full audience. Um, at that point, we had put together a 15 page health and safety plan that had been reviewed by the head of epidemiology at Memorial Hermann Texas Medical Center. Uh, he had kind of endorsed that and signed off on what we wanted to do to get a band and singers on the stage. So once we were able to pitch it, um, even to our board of directors who at first, you know, were very skeptical about this idea of can we pull off this fundraiser virtually, when we were able to pitch it as don't think of it as a virtual fundraiser or like we're all just on a Zoom webinar like this. Think of it as an award show or a Jerry Lewis telethon, like a, a, a TV special being broadcast live from the George. And so that's kind of the way we spun it. If you saw the gala, that's kind of what we did. And it was tremendously successful. We exceeded. So our, our uh, fundraising goal for that night for the original in-person event was $300,000. We ended up doing 364,000 even after we pivoted to a virtual event and we spent $33,000 less than our original budget um, to, to spend on the show because we weren't doing dinner and drinks for 450 people. We weren't renting linens and tables and chairs. So we took some of that extra money and poured it all into the video production element, but still came in well under budget. So we, we ended up doing much better on the gala than we ever would have in person. So um, I have to give a lot of credit to Sherry on that. Oh, thank you. Jake, tell, talk a little bit about our reach with the virtual gala. Like, you know, what, what were some of the unexpe unexpected positive consequences of, of doing this virtual gala? So what really started to intrigue me um, is when others, uh, other theaters that we talked to had done this, they talked about how much they were able to expand their reach. And what really made the difference, what put us over the top in terms of bringing in more money for that event than we ever had before, was, the, was all the little donations, the 25, 50, $100 donations that came in from people who never would have been at this event otherwise. Some of you are probably on this call tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so we had over 4,000 streams of the gala. Uh, 600 of those were on YouTube, 3,700 of those were on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've got, you know, when you consider that, especially on YouTube, one stream is typically being watched by at least two people. Uh, some people had parties. Uh, we had one of our board members threw a huge, like, socially distanced party in her backyard and had a huge screen up. Um, so to broaden our reach, I think last year's event, we had 177 unique donors. This year's event, we had 380 unique donors. Mm -hmm. That is huge. So the, the, the big kind of wow uh, revelation in all this was how much we were able to expand our reach. And, and that's what put us over the top in terms of our fundraising goal. And I think what was amazing is that we had donors from all over the country. We mm -hmm. had people donating on our auction items from, you know, from Ohio and from Tennessee and I mean, from all over the place. And all over the world. We had people watching yeah. Uh, in the UK, uh, mm -hmm. in Canada. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, and what I loved about it, I think, is that we were able to call some, some of the senior living uh, facilities around the city, and they were able to live stream the gala to the, the individual rooms in some of the centers. I know we, we had some, we have uh, several um, ushers, and they live at the Buckingham. 
and they we were able to talk to their marketing director and they live streamed it directly into their bedrooms and the, into their rooms and they were so excited about being able to watch the gala um and so thankful so and i know some of them are on today so yeah we're glad you were able to join us so jake tell me uh what you think the hardest part of planning this virtual gala and implementing the virtual gala what was the, the toughest part about it um I guess I'd have to say all the health and safety protocols would be the hardest part because putting on shows is what we do. Not that that's easy at all, but you know, that's in our wheelhouse. We know how to put on a great show. Um, but the extreme measures that we went to to make sure that we were being safe and that everybody involved with the production of it felt safe. Um, it was a lot and it was a lot on our team. I mean, we have an incredible team of people that were working behind the scenes. Our production director, Kat Hatcher, kind of ran point on all of those protocols. But I mean, it was a health screening for every single person who came into the theater to be a part of it. Every single day they came in, it was a new health screening, temperature checks, everybody in face coverings, never within six feet of each other. If that mask was off, it was because you were singing into a microphone straight out with nobody around you or in front of you. Um, not only having to hold our own people accountable to those protocols, but also the uh, staging solutions people and the camera crew that were there. Um, that, you know, that's a whole nother layer to add to what is already a very uh, complicated process of putting a show together like that. Um, so I guess I'd say that was probably the most difficult. Yeah, one of the challenges, and I, I guess it was for us as well, once we internally sort of got on board with the idea of uh, the virtual gala. Because we um, had asked our board of directors and some other supporters to, hey, go watch these live galas. It's gonna be like this. And when those didn't turn out to be very good, <laughs> then we had to like really convince people of, of what the vision for this is going to be. Um, because nobody could wrap their minds around it. All they could wrap their minds around, and even us too, to a certain degree, was what we had seen and what our prior experience was. Mm -hmm. But, you know, landing on that, the idea of making this like a telethon, that sort of visual was helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other things that was helpful for the gala, and I don't know if we'll get to this, if you had planned on getting this or not, was just a little, the minor addition of the fake applause. Oh. <laughs> was such part. a huge help, I think, audibly for people watching. Because when you see a performance and then you hear crickets, you know, it's, it's weird. So, you know, Jake decided, he thought, I, I'll let you tell that story about how that came about, but I really thought that added an ambiance to the event that, that really, really was helpful. Oh no, it was just, I mean, the way it came about was I was watching a soccer game with my son. It was like the first live sporting event since COVID was a soccer game in Germany. So we turned it on and we're hearing all this crowd noise and looking at the empty stadium. And I was like, well, what's going on? And then I realized, oh my gosh, they're piping that in. Um, and you know, I think we've all seen, I allude to like the live musicals that they've done on NBC. Uh, yeah. They started with The Sound of Music with Carrie Underwood and they've done The Wiz and Peter Pan and several yeah. others. And it's always so awkward that when they end this huge, amazing musical number and then it's just crickets, you hear nothing. It sucks the energy right out of the viewer. Yeah. And so even though it was fake and we acknowledged throughout the broadcast that it was fake as a joke, but it's a psychological thing as you're watching it. When you hear that applause, when, or when you don't notice it when you hear it, you really notice it when you don't hear it. And it's, sorry, I go think ahead. we're gonna start incorporating that and, and, when people come back to the theater. We're just gonna pop in fake applause yeah, and laugh at all of our shows. Well, the, and the other thing is I was in the audience that evening and being in the audience was also very difficult because I was, you know, I was up in the balcony and I'm watching these amazing performances and I couldn't clap. We couldn't say anything. We had to be very, very quiet. So I had guilt. I, I thought, oh, I feel so bad. I'm not clapping for them because they're, you know, I, I was like, ah, I was air clapping. Um, but yeah, it was tough. I think on both on both sides, it's just not what we're used to. Um, well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna call an audible. I think that's what you do in football. Is that right? An audible. I'm changing the plan here because um, we've got some really great questions. So we're gonna do like half the time on the gala, the other half, if that's okay with you guys. Um, so we've got some good questions here for you. Um, this Zoom thing is really cool. It just gives me the questions right here. Um, so do you see, uh, from Pam Hensley, do you see future galas incorporating the virtual aspect? Uh, yes. So thank you for your question, Pam. Mm -hmm. um, we've talked about this even moving forward, uh, that it was so successful and it broadened our reach, our reach so much 
that we have we now have our own streaming equipment in the theater the streaming equipment we used for the for the gala came with staging solutions in their their package but we now have our own and um we we don't know exactly what it looks like yet but uh we're very much considering streaming this event every year even when we're back in person doing it to have some sort of a, a streaming ticket or, or option that's available um because of how much it broadened our reach and, and how well yeah. it did and I also want to just kind of thank the Fondren Foundation. Uh, the Fondren Foundation was very gracious, and they are the ones that uh, that um, allowed us to purchase with their grant to purchase the live streaming cameras. So we're very excited about that. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we've got another question from Chandra Marie. Um, oh, the, Chandra. I know. Hi, Chandra. Uh, Hi, the you information know? you sent to the oh, I can't believe you're going to make me say this word. Jake, what's the word that starts with an E P I D? Epidemiology. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that one. Wait, the question. Did Chandra was, spell it right? That's what I want to know. Oh, hold on. Answered. Um, that word helped with convincing Equity that you had a good and safe plan, and um, it was such a fun event online. Although I miss seeing all you guys in person. Um, so we're in the process of working with Actors Equity, Chandra, on that health and safety plan. So there's a worksheet that we have to fill out and then we submit that plan to them and then we'll kind of go back and forth. But yes, I do think that will be helpful. Um, the person that I've been in contact with Actors Equity has said, you know, if you, if you have um, recommendations from doctors like that, include all of that because all of that will be taken into consideration. And I'll say, I don't know if this is what you were asking, Chandra, but even though there were equity members who were singing on stage, including myself and Kevin, um, the a concert is not under equity's jurisdiction as a union. Right. So we have come to an agreement and have a, a, a contract with AFM, uh, American Federation of Musicians, that is the musicians union. Um, but we're continuing to work with equity for when we start producing traditional plays and musicals, which are under their union's jurisdiction. Thanks for that question. Okay, so we have another question from Belinda Rossiter. Hi, Belinda. Uh, Belinda. What are the things you saw in other events that were bad? Okay, don't mention <laughs> it. Don't mention any names. I, I won't. I'll, I'll say I, I won't mention any names or the theater or anything like that. Or the ones that I watched, but they tried the, hard. It it just the the energy was very low, and there was a lack of theatricality to it, especially mm -hmm. from a theater or a performing arts organization doing a gala to raise money for their art and for theater, the lack of theatricality and even the lack of theater of any kind uh, really was um, what didn't work for me. Um, you know, they interviewed artists and actors and stuff that were associated with the organization, but um, just, you know, again, that lack of energy and that lack of theatricality sort of stood out. It was, it was clunky. Like we saw several yeah. that were clunky and there was one that um, I was very excited to watch. It was a theater I was very familiar with. Um, it was not in Houston, by the way. Um, <laughs> we, uh, uh, I, I, was, I picked up my phone to give. They gave the information on how to give and I picked up my phone to make a donation and then the information was gone. And I had to wait another 10 minutes to get it. And that's when we said, okay. So there was a missed opportunity there. You had a donor with, with my phone in my hand ready to give you money and I had to wait another 10 minutes to your house. So that's why we put the ticker tape at the bottom mm -hmm. and you, you, it didn't matter the entire time you could see how to give money. But yeah, there were just um, uh, another, another, another thing with the, with the fake applause. Like there was a host on that one that she kept, she kept making jokes and then like waiting for the joke to mm -hmm. land as if there was an audience there to laugh at it. And it was just so awkward. And so we did, I mean, I will say, we owe them a lot of gratitude because we learned a lot by seeing what doesn't work. And not that we couldn't, I mean, Kevin and I, I don't know if we were funny, we were trying to be funny, but we couldn't hear any of you laughing. But we said, it, if we, we say a joke, you gotta move right past it. You can't wait to pretend like people are gonna laugh when they're not there. You know, don't leave, don't leave these awkward spaces in the air, just keep going. I think it goes against all my natural instincts, by the way. <laughs> there were also a lot of disconnects for me in some of those galas. Um, the lighting was really bad, so you couldn't see. The, um, there was lag time. There were transition issues. I mean, there were a lot of things people did not foresee when they were, when they were putting on these virtual galas. And I think the content was probably really good, but it was so confusing because you would go from one place to another place, and like, it, there was just no cohesion. And so I think when we were 
talking about this, we really paid attention to how it flowed, kind of psycho like what does the audience want and expect and what do they need and how do we keep them engaged? So we spent a lot of time, I think, on that. So, okay, we have another question from Kim Tobin Lale. Hi, Kim. Um, would you consider, this answer to this is yes, would you consider renting your streaming equipment to other smaller arts organizations? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Of, of course. course. With the exception of fourth wall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, Catherine Dunaway, did you incorporate tangible uh, interactive elements for guests, such as sending gift baskets, uh, gift basket type perks? Sherry, why don't you answer that? That was, that was kind of your department. Yeah, actually, we did. Um, we, were, we have a, a restaurant partner. Uh, they were our catering partner and we had already contracted with them and so we used them. We were able to create a special menu to send out to all of our patrons, people who purchase tables. We also had it on our website, but people who purchase tables and we, um, they were able to order and we encouraged watch parties so they were able to order from that menu and have that food delivered to their homes. We also sent goodie bags uh, that included a George Theater mask. We sent a small bottle of champagne. We had, I don't have cups with me, but we have um, sippy cups that we always have for the theater. Um, and they have the after dinner fair logo on them. We sent them those. And we also created a, a, a physical program. And the program had all of the information for the evening, but it also had all of the auction items. And so um, it was really great because you were able to do, um, see auction items on your phone, but then you also had a physical, you know, uh, program. And, um, and the program was beautiful. And I think we got, we did not expect this, but we had a lot of our guests um, comment to us on how beautiful the programs were and how they appreciated it because they were able to share it with their people who hadn't registered for auction items. They were able to be able to share it with their um, guests at their parties. And so, yeah. Shout out it, to um, Holly Cade, who is um, our in-house graphics designer who designed that and did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. Um, Kim also is saying this is really helpful for those of us considering an online gala. Uh, Jake, do you want to talk a little bit, Kevin, about what we're doing for other organizations considering online galas? Well, yes. Yeah. So um, we've actually been overwhelmed with people reaching out to us to pick our brains about online galas. So um, we're, we've put together a, a small little consulting package for people who are interested in uh, producing uh, an online fundraiser. Um, all of us kind of became experts in this over the last six months. So um, if you serve on the board of a nonprofit or you know a nonprofit that is wanting to do this and doesn't know how to do this, um, that are interested in something like that, we would be happy to talk to them. Is that information up on the website yet, Sherry? It I is. Uh, we created the is web it? page and we were tweaking it today and it'll probably be live tomorrow. And then we're also going to send an email to everyone letting people know that we're going to be doing that as soon as the web page goes live. Um, and so we have another question um, from Franklin Harburg. Is this a fee service? Uh, Jake, you want to talk a little bit about why, like what we're talk, thinking about? Yes, so it would be it would be a very reasonable fee service. We're not, I mean, we're not talking about just a, a two minute phone conversation. Let me tell you how, how we we're, <laughs> we're happy to be doing these sorts of things for anybody to tune in and listen to. And I've I've had several uh, local colleagues in Houston that that have reached out and we've had conversations about what we did. But the consulting package that we're talking about putting together it would be very comprehensive and would take up uh, quite a bit of our team's time to be able to help do so that would be a that would be a fee service and you know the other what we found uh what we found is that um people need uh talent they need mcs um, but they also need to understand the whole uh connection between the 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 company that we hired to help us do the live streaming the cameras the production the video i mean there were so many different components and that's a lot of, we had six months to learn all of this information and we know a lot of people are, are putting planning their galas within the next couple of months um, the other thing to think about is that there are you know you probably will have very minimal costs for food and linens and tables and chairs and all of those rentals um, and i said so i think we were able to spend just a fraction of the amount we were gonna spend on producing a, an in-person gala. Um, so really in the end, our, our budget was reduced by, I don't know, $50,000, something like that. So we, you know, if we had to pay for consulting, we, we would have had a, a little bit of money to do that. So 
um, an anonymous, anonymous attendee, the uh, opening video was spectacular. Um, it was a spectacular start of the show. Was that complex to produce? Uh, so uh, that was probably the most complex moment of the evening, and I'll tell you why. Um, well, funny where this came from. So I have, uh, <laughs> I have twin sons who are nine, uh, and I also have a five-year-old. They all have um, record players, like, like vinyl record players in their rooms, which was a Christmas gift. And um, we love to go to vintage record stores and they pick out. I love that I get to influence their musical tastes now. I know they're going to reach an age where they, that, that no longer is the situation. Um, but uh, my son Nash bought a uh, Frank Sinatra live at Madison Square Garden record. And uh, Howard Cosell does the intro. Uh, and the video of that concert, I think, is still on Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, you can watch it. Um, but at the time, it was kind of his big comeback special. And so that uh, announcement was uh, a spoof of that Howard Cosell intro that I'd heard on my son's Frank Sinatra record. Uh, so I called a friend of mine who's a brilliant kind of impressionist who lives in Nashville, asked him if he would record the voiceover. So I, I rewrote the intro and would he record it in kind of the style of Howard Cosell. But uh, if you recall, like that had some a music bed underneath it. It was this really great kind of big bandy sort of exciting music bed that went underneath it. And it even had special hits, you know, after we would say a certain name of a, of a performer and there'd be a drum hit. And all of that was, was custom uh, orchestrated and composed. So Stephen W. Jones, who was our music director, wrote that piece and chartered it for the nine piece band. Uh, and he wrote it based on the voiceover and where those hits would come in. So the voiceover and the video were both pre-recorded, but the band was live. Uh, not only that, but it see, if you recall, it seamlessly went into Let Me Be Your Star, which was the opening number live on the stage with the girls singing. There was no stop in the, in the, in the music. It went right from that right into the, as if it was the same song. So there was a click track created. If you don't know what that is, it's like if you know what a metronome is. A click track is something that oftentimes musicians will use in their in-ear in-ears in the studio that keeps them in the right tempo. So it's just a click track is just it just sounds like tick 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 like that. So they had to play to a click track to make sure that they were exactly on tempo to line up with the video because they were live, the video was pre-recorded. They also had to play to the click track so that the song that they went into seamlessly for the girls to start the show was in the same tempo and the same key as the song that was composed to go under the opening announcement. So that was more information than you asked for, but yeah. it was definitely the most complicated moment to pull mm -hmm. off. And we were kind of geeking out about it out backstage. We were, I was very nervous. My heart was like racing, like, please let this work. And so it was pretty, it was pretty cool. Well, we were, we wish that we could cut to the live band so people could see that that was live, but the video was already done and we didn't think about that until after the fact. And we're like, man, it'd be great if we could like cut to the band to see that they're the ones that are actually playing this live. And, and, you know, sitting in the audience that night watching it happen, I don't know, I think that was probably the best part. Just watching, because all of those cameras were in the, they were in the, in the theater and I could see behind and I could see what was happening on the cameras. And so I saw the video playing and then I saw the band. It, I mean, it was really amazing to watch that. It was so technical. It was way over my head. And I just, I, you know, and I, I was trying to, I was like trying to, I had all these things. I was trying to figure, you know, out how do I bid on my auction items and pay attention. And but it, it was very, very cool. So, all right, well, uh, we are going to transition now uh, to our 2020-2021 season. A lot of things have happened over the past uh, few months. And I know having conversations, um, our weekly conversations with our executive committee and with our board, you know, like we, we didn't know what was gonna happen and we weren't sure and we couldn't make a decision. It was hurry up and wait and hurry up and wait. Um, and I know a lot of thought and a lot of, um, a lot of work went into the season. So Kevin, I want, if you uh, would, just share with us kind of your thought process over the past couple of months and maybe what you went through over the past couple of months together trying to uh, think about planning the season. Yeah, it, you know, um, so this season, the 2020-2021 season, uh, 
is the first season that I had a chance to sort of curate and oversee as the official artistic director at the 80 Players. You know, I had overseen sort of that process as an associate artistic director or an interim artistic director, but there was always sort of, um, you know, just in some an uncertainty, uh, long-term uncertainty uh, during those processes. So, you know, a year and a half ago, la at the last gala, when, you know, we announced that I was the new artistic director without the interim, um, you know, putting this season together was a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of, um, I was really um, emotionally attached mm -hmm. to each of the shows and to each of the directors and to the creative teams that we assembled because, you know, this was going to be my first season um, as artistic director. Oh my God. And when COVID hit and it, it became clear we were going to have to um, make a decision on the Spitfire Grill, and we were still at that time keeping our fingers crossed about Sound of Music, but then it turns out Sound of Music we were going to have to to cancel. You know, I really sort of delayed making that decision that we're gonna have to alter the 2020 2021 season for a while just because I was so emotionally attached to it and when we finally did there was you know uh, depression is probably too strong a word but I mean I there was that was difficult for me emotionally to sort of let go of what that season uh, meant to me um, and then it wasn't going to look like what we had wanted it to look like um, you know, we were going to have to make some delays and we weren't sure, you know, pivot has become the buzzword during, during this, right? You have to make plans based on the information you have, and then you get new information, which causes you to have to pivot and pivot. And, and uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that was a really the most difficult part, I guess, early on in, uh, in the season planning was, you know, we're going to have to deconstruct this season that we put so much heart and soul into. Tell us a little bit about the, like the, the changes, you know, like what are some of the things that you did? You know, I know that our, uh, our friends and our patrons have received emails and they've received some information about some of the different things we're doing, but how did you make those decisions about what the 2020, 2020, 2021 season changes were going to be? And what did you do with some of those, um, some of the programming? We wanted to try to keep as much of the season intact as we could. So then it became, all right, well, if we're not gonna be able to produce in the fall, uh, one part, part of that's uh, related to Actors' Equity, right? And whether or not um, alongside Actors' Equity, we all feel like it's safe to go back to work and to produce a play where actors feel safe, where directors feel safe, and where audience members feel safe. So um, we're still sort of in the process of working that out. We're moving forward optimistically that we'll be able to um, you know, open the season with uh, uh, the, at least the first play that we'll produce with Photo 51 in January. Um, so we wanted to try to keep as much continuity as we could. It was a smaller cast show. We felt like that was, um, it was a good fit for the first show that we're going to produce, um, the first play that we're going to produce. So that was the idea behind that. So then the question became, well, what's the fall going to look like? What's Christmas going to look like? You know, we kept our fingers crossed about Christmas as long as we could. And uh, so then we started thinking, well, you know what, because of what we learned at the gala, we can socially distance a concert um, pretty easily. And we have a relationship with Michael Ingersoll and Artist Lounge Live. Um, we've, they've come in and done um, a number of concerts with us before, so we know how to do that. We'd already built some of those concerts into the season already. So then we just were like, okay, well, let's just Let's take this concert out from this time slot. Let's move it here. And then maybe let's do an extended run rather than a two night event or a three night event. We can offer this as just sort of um, a replacement of sorts uh, for a main stage show. Um, and these aren't your typical everyday concerts. You know, I mean, there's a good deal of storytelling that's involved. They're extremely theatrical. Um, the artists are some of the best artists in the world. My goodness, John Mark Magaha. If you tuned into our, our gala, you saw him perform. He's coming back to do um, Sign, Seal, Delivered. Steve, uh, John Mark Magaha sings Stevie Wonder. Um, and so we thought, all right, well, we can do that. But then we felt like, you know, what other sort of storytelling programming can we do? And uh, a couple of years ago, I directed It's a Wonderful Life live radio play. And in that research, I listened to a ton of old time radio and fell in love with it. The Shadow and Dragnet and all those old old time radio series. And so I thought, well, what if we just did a couple of those, you know, um, some just, you know, half hour long 
old time radio plays. And so we did that. So we, we actually recorded two of them, uh, an Agatha Christie, uh, Hercule Poirot story, and then a Sherlock Holmes adventure. So we've got two of those that'll be coming out at the end of October. And then um, <laughs> we were looking at what do we want to do for Christmas? Um, and so uh, Jessica Peterson, who had adapted the Christmas shoes for us, we engaged her to adapt a radio play, a Christmas radio play. Um, and so we're gonna, it's called A Cattywampus Christmas. Um, and so we're really looking forward to that. That's more of a traditional, I think that was gonna be about an hour long. Um, but so those were sort of the, some of the, the thought processes behind, you know, what program are we gonna replace and what are we gonna replace it with? Mm -hmm. What about, um, tell us a little bit about how people are gonna be able to access the live radio plays. It's a great question, Sherry. Um, I think we're going to do that on Vimeo. Is that right, Jake? I, that's the last. That's the plan. Last I heard. Uh, yeah, we were going to do a. Uh, you'd be able to purchase a Vimeo link and have uh, access to that, where you'd be able to listen to it through that platform. And so you'll be able to. We'll be able to purchase the the live stream, get the link, and then you can watch it like any time. Like I really don't know. Any uh, the radio plays won't be live streamed. These are pre-recorded. Oh, okay. yeah. pre-recorded. You'll, so get a link. you'll get a link. Uh, you'll get to purchase a link that you'll have a special password to that w that'll be protected. So you won't be able to share it with someone so that you can't pay for it and then send it to all your friends. But you'll get a link that you can then stream it and listen to it. Got it. These are fun too. These were, these are all original old time radio scripts. Like these were, I found uh, the original recording of one of them um, was really good. Really fun. Except for a Caddy Wampus Christmas. Yeah. Caddy Wampus Christmas is an original work. So um, tell me a little bit about, um, so the other night we went, uh, we were at the theater for the first time and it was really exciting. I almost had tears uh, in my eyes, um, just walking to the theater and getting to walk in and, and watch a, a show. But tell us a little bit about what touring is doing and uh, what- Yeah, what so we have um, a touring unit, uh, the a regional touring unit that takes place to schools and churches and uh, whoever will, will book them um, all over the state. Um, and when COVID hit, we were like, well, what are we going to do with that? We had planned on doing a show, it's called Apollo to the Moon, and it's a one-person show, but it can have other actors if you choose to produce it that way. So we had two apprentices that we were going to come in and be in this show, but then when COVID hit, we thought it might be wiser to do a one-person show. So our touring unit and everything we do with the touring unit is not under the jurisdiction of Actors' Equity. Um, so every year we do like touring at the George and whatever touring offering we have for schools, we'll have it play on the George stage for a limited amount of time. Um, just so to get people to come in and see the show and to raise awareness for our, uh, our educational touring unit. So yeah, we, we opened Apollo to the Moon, which is a one man play about sort of the history of the Apollo program. Um, it's told through the eyes of this, uh, this actor, this, or this, uh, I guess he's a, uh, an astrologist who wants to become an astronaut. And so he's following the Apollo program as it grows. Um, yeah, so it starts with Apollo 1 and ends with Apollo 11. And it's really, really amazing. I mean, it, 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 I, you're right. I mean, being at the theater for the first time, it's, oh, it was it's our first opening night since February. Mm. And um, we had a socially distanced audience. We have about 61 or 62 people there that were all socially distanced in the Or 50 section. Um, all wearing masks, um, and it was really, really incredible. You know, it felt a little bit like the first day of fifth grade or the first day of ninth grade, you know, when you're, you're coming into school and you get to see all of your old <laughs> friends and you haven't seen them all summer and people were so excited and, and, you know, it was very socially distanced and, you know, but we had some of our friends throughout the audience and it was, you know, people were texting each other because we couldn't talk to each other uh, and it really, it really was amazing to be able to walk into the theater and 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 watch a show. It was it was great. Well, and we should say that the primary purpose of that show is to be filmed and then streamed yeah. into schools. Uh, the video version of it, and also at Miller, Miller Outdoor Theater, they're going to they're going to show our filmed version there. Uh, but we do have, I think, maybe six more. It's a very limited number of live in person mm -hmm. performances of that at the George. Um, but so we're good. excited to be partnering. We always partner with young audiences of Houston, uh, but we're one of their few virtual partners this year that we actually have 
a virtual option for schools that they can stream these things into the building without anybody actually coming in. And this one, because uh, our performer, our intern, our apprentice, uh, Sebas del Toro, he's bilingual. So we will have an English and a Spanish version of it. And he was so good. Can you imagine? He's incredible. He just graduated he's from college, his first play is out of college and that was it. And it was amazing. The technology was amazing what the production got oh it was, it was beautiful so if you all haven't uh, had a chance to get your tickets and come come to the theater please do um okay so we have a question we're looking forward to it's anonymous we're looking forward to stevie wonder on 1023 please give us an idea of social distancing and other protocols for the show uh yes yeah, so um uh, Sign Seal Delivered, John Mark McGaha sings Stevie Wonder, opens on, I think, October 13th now, and it's going to go all the way through October 31st. So this was originally a two-night event, um, and it's now going to be three weeks. Um, so uh, let me talk a little bit about our health and safety protocols. Um, first of all, we, uh, we'll be sending out a press release later this week, but we are going to be what I believe, to my knowledge, the first theater in the country to install hospital grade UV lights on all of our HVAC systems. So that means these are UV lights that anything, any air that passes over these lights, any bacterial or viral particles in that air will be killed as they, as they cross over these lights. So all of the air that is sucked out of the theater and recycled back into the theater has to pass over these lights as it goes back in. Um, so we're very, very excited about that. Uh, there aren't many people who are doing that. Um, and as all the, all the more recent research that has come out about COVID is very, very focused on the fact that it's airborne in, in what is in the air. Um, face coverings are required for everybody that comes into the building. Uh, they have to be worn the entire time. And as we said to lots of people, we understand if you're not comfortable with that and that's not for you, that's why we have streaming options available for the Stevie Wonder Show. And uh, for the whole month of December, we're doing um, Merry Christmas Darling, Heidi Kettenring sings Karen Carpenter. So that was another show that we had booked to come in for two nights only. It's now gonna run the whole month of December. Um, and that will be available for live streaming into your home as well. Uh, when you get to the theater, you, you'll be sent uh, 48, 24 to 48 hours in advance You'll be sent um, your zone and the time that you're assigned to come to the theater. It's almost like boarding an airplane. That's just to make sure that not everybody is showing up at the same time, which is harder to distance people. So you've got kind of like a 15 minute window in which we ask you to arrive. Uh, we have decals on the floor to make sure everybody is six feet apart. Uh, you will have your temperature scanned uh, before you can actually enter the facility. Um, if anyone has a temperature of over 100.4 degrees, um, unfor unfortunately, you'll be asked to not enter the, for the, the facility. You'll have several options with your tickets. Of course, we'll refund you all of that. But in order to keep everybody safe, that's what we're doing. Uh, there are hand touchless hand sanitizer stations all over the theater. Um, E-tickets. Yes, E-tickets. E we're not doing any printed tickets. Nothing is being handed to you. You're not handing anything to anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, the entire experience should be completely contact free and touchless free uh, or no touchless, not touchless free <laughs> uh, and all of the seating. So um, all of the tickets to these music events are general admission, meaning you purchase a ticket and then we will give you your seat assignment. That's really the only way that we can distance groups. Unfortunately, it's just impossible to let people select specific seats. Um, so uh, our box office then goes through everybody who's coming, they distance them out. So only every other row in the theater is sat and there is a minimum of two, two seats, two empty seats on either side of each party that's coming together at minimum. Oftentimes it's more space than that. So there's, there should be a six foot radius around every group that's in the theater. Face coverings are worn the whole time. The UV lights are in the HVAC units. You will never be I mean, at the, at the bare minimum, there will be 20 feet between you and any sort of performer on the stage that doesn't have a mask on. Um, am I leaving anything out, guys? That's a lot. I don't think so. I think that's... I can tell you I came, um, so I was there Friday night, uh, the first night that we, we had uh, people in the building, and you know, I wasn't involved in the protocols and what was going on. And I can tell you I felt very safe. You know, we, we were assigned a 
a time slot we could walk into the theater. Uh, there were there was like the zone one, zone two, and zone three, and we received a very detailed email with all of the information, our seat numbers, and when we could go into the theater. And so um, during our assigned time, we got up, we walked in, and it was so simple to follow. You know, there was like the green dots for going in and the red dots for coming out. And um, and and then and and then being inside, I felt very very safe. Um, you know, during this this time, the past six months, you know, I I have been home, and um, and it I, it just felt very very thoughtful and very considerate and very safe. Uh, there's also uh, th there's an announcement made at the end of the show mm. that uh, each row will be dismissed by ushers. So we start, we start with the back row and do it that way so that people aren't bunching. Um, there's no congregating in the lobby before or after. Uh, for right now, there are no concessions. We will allow you to bring your own water bottle with you. Um, but for right now, we're not doing any sort of food or beverage service. Um, so we're, we're doing just about anything we can possibly think of. Our front of house director, Christy Watkins, has just done a phenomenal job putting those protocols together. Um, and it was really, I was really proud of her and our whole team on Friday night, seeing how well it was implemented um, and how, yeah. um, and frankly, how great and compliant everybody was with it. Because it, it can, we've, we've said in a, we kind of have a new statement that we're going to put out and put on a lot of our social media and stuff, uh, just sort of advertising all the things that we're doing from a health standpoint. But this takes teamwork. We, we all know that we all have to be a little bit uncomfortable and wear a face covering over our, over our face to be able to come back to the theater. Um, it's the things that we have to do in order to make this safe for everybody. Um, because if we don't, if we don't take the proper precautions uh, and we have people on staff or in a cast or, or an artist or something that test positive, then we've got to shut it down again. And so um, we feel very confident in what we've done uh, the epidemiologist that has reviewed, our, has reviewed our plan feels confident in what we've done. The uh, musicians union in Houston feels very confident with what we've done and they have issued us contracts for their members. Um, so we hope that people will come. Um, we had several testimonies even on Facebook from Friday night of people that came and said, you guys just did such a phenomenal job with the health protocols. Oh, that's the other thing I was going to say. Uh, no intermissions right now. Everything is about 90 minutes or less with no intermission to cut down on traffic to the bathrooms and people climbing over each other. Um, but we studied kind of plans from all over the country and what people are doing, what churches are doing. Um, and we feel like we are being as safe as we possibly can be, not to mention, you know, frankly, the significant uh, financial investment we're making in the things like the UV lights. Um, we're kind of trying to take the long view here because we know this isn't something that people are just going to be concerned about through Christmas. I think it's going to be something that people will be concerned about for a while. We've got, a, we've got an amazing team, um, you know, top to bottom. We're so blessed to be able to work uh, with some amazing people that, that think through all these details um, and then executed it Friday night flawlessly. You know, I mean, that was, it was sort of a Guinea pig in, in some ways we'd never actually put that plan into practice and to see how smoothly everything went uh, is just a testament to how amazing it is. And frankly, we felt a great deal of responsibility. I mean, we would, we would anyway, but uh, the only other performing arts organization in Houston that opened for any sort of live performance before us was the Houston Symphony. Right. So being only the second uh, organization in town right. to offer any sort of live offering, you know, we, we had lots of conversations about like, we better have these protocols on lockdown uh, because a lot of people will be looking at us. The other thing I think that's different, um, if you can talk about this, is uh, how you'll be seated, where your seats will be, and the box office, and what they're doing. Um, but, you know, because it's, it's, we're being assigned seats. You don't get to choose where you want to sit. Right, yeah, and I, I mentioned that a bit earlier, that yeah. unfortunately we can't allow you to choose your seat, though if you've been at our theater, there's really not a bad seat. And occasionally there's a, there's a set that's created for a show where there are certain areas in the theater where you can't see a certain side of the stage as well. But these are concerts. The, the, the main you know, singer will be right front and center the whole time. There is not a bad seat in that theater where you don't have a great view of that person. And let me tell you, John Mark, I mean, you <laughs> guys saw him on the gala. I've said so many times, I, I have I've been so privileged to have met and worked with some of the most talented people on the face of the planet. 
if somebody put a gun to my head and said, tell me the most talented person that you know or you've ever seen, John Mark Magaha is the name that would come up. I mean, I thought you were going to say me, but I thought you were going to say me. <laughs> Thanks. No, I mean, he's just ridiculous. And the, his show is, uh, it, it's unbelievable. So um, I hope if you feel safe and feel comfortable that you will come out and check him out because it's, it's just kind of jaw droppingly good. It is. Um, I, I have a, uh, just another quick question, Kevin. Um, mm -hmm. And then, well, a couple more questions and we're, we're like 12 minutes out. So we're gonna try to get as many questions in as possible. Um, what are you guys the most excited for in this upcoming season? You know, I know, I know it's been tough, but what, you know, what, uh, put on your happy faces and, you know, what are you the most excited about? There's a lot of things I think, honestly, to be excited about. Um, the fact that we're streaming our shows so that if people don't feel safe coming to the theater, they'll, they'll be able to stream our shows and still see, see the play. Um, but the one I'm most excited about is Apollo 8, the world premiere, um, which we've moved. It was, <laughs> we would be doing it right now if, uh, if COVID hadn't happened. But um, instead, we moved it from the fall to the spring. Um, it's just, it's just, it's an incredible story for those of you that aren't familiar with the Apollo 8 story, which is where we uh, orbited the moon for the first time. And it's the first time that people on Earth saw what the Earth looked like from the moon's perspective. Um, it's the Earthrise photograph, and it's incredible. Well, it's an incredible story um, that Jamie McGann adapted into uh, for the stage, and it's just, it's so great. I'm so excited to share that with our audience. James Black is directing it. James Black was a Houston icon from the Alley Theater, um, and he is a, a huge NASA nerd, uh, <laughs> which really, I mean, he's just, it's, I'm really, really excited to share that. And we should mention that that is a world premiere commissioned yeah. by 80 players. So we commissioned Jamie to write this piece. It is a world premiere production. Kevin and I are actually both going to be in it. It's the first time we've ever been in a show together. Uh, I'm playing Jim Lovell. He's playing Frank Borman. And uh, um, so, you know, we're just hopeful and prayerful and keeping our fingers crossed that, that we get to produce that and everything else, the way that we've fully envisioned it because like Kevin said, we were supposed to be doing it right now. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm ex we're excited about that. We have another, this is a, hold on, uh, not a question, just want you to know that everyone uh, in the 80 players team, we miss you all and we miss all the shows. Virus protocols are a necessary inconvenience, but are not a big deal to us. So thank you. Awesome. Kevin. Thank you for that attitude. We love it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Chandra. This makes me happy. I'm looking forward to seeing you two in the show. I don't know about that. <laughs> we'll see if Kevin can keep up. I, I'm not sure that he's ever. I don't know. I don't know. Caliber before, so. Jake's uh, Jake's used to being in, in you know only two handers, right? Like two with Maury, where he doesn't have to share the stage with that many actors. Um, so we'll see. So Chandra, I have two more questions. A lot of people don't know Chandra has actually will be yeah. a part of uh, the radio plays. She uh, she voiced a couple of the roles for the um, the two mystery plays. So. That's exciting. Yeah. So I have two more questions. Uh, we have about nine minutes left. Um, so when will you be planning the 2020, it's so hard to say, the 2021, 2022 season? Uh, well, I'm, I'm working on it right now. Um, and I, you know, it, it, it's a process and it, we start that process, um, you know, in September every year. It's a weird process to start this year just because of all the uncertainty. Um, and, you know, you, you, for me anyway, I look at our seasons as, you know, a series of momentum builders. So each show, you know, tries to build onto the next show and you create this momentum swing. And, you know, so you end your season, like we ended our season with West Side Story last year that then swung into The Hiding Place, which then went into Miracle on 34th Street. And then guess who's coming to dinner and we built all this great momentum and then we lost it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to anticipate how to, you know, how are we gonna rev that momentum up again? But um, yeah, so we've already started. We're, start, we're starting to create a short list of plays. Uh, we already know one of them. We're doing um, uh, Christmas shoes. We move from this Christmas to next Christmas. So uh, one down and four to go. Is there anything else we moved from this season to next season? Just the Christmas shoes. Just the Christmas shoes, okay. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the other ones like um, Is He Dead? 
uh, you know, and considering that for next year, but, you know, we don't want to paint ourselves into a corner just yet. We want to see what all the scripts we're considering um, and then uh, sort of see what sort of narrative that creates. So I've got a couple more questions. Jake, tell me when, um, when is your next gala? Uh. <laughs> that was, that's a loaded question. I don't even know the exact date off, my, off the top of my head. It's in the spring. Like March, and, uh, March 28th or something Usually like that. There's a year between galas and now there's not. And I mean, the thought of needing to plan the next gala right now makes me want to curl up in a ball and yeah. go in my closet and never come out. But, because <laughs> it's a lot of work, not because it's not awesome. March 28th, I just saw it. Um, March 28th is the next gala. So, um, unfortunately, it is time, believe it or not, we start planning that thing in October every year. Mm -hmm. uh, we try to get our auction committee all jazzed up and excited in the fall to kind of secure as many items as they can before we lose everybody to Christmas. Because when you're working with volunteers who are amazing, but once you get to like December 10th, you can just plan on not ever having your volunteers again until like January 10th. Right. Um, so that, that process starts right now, actually. Um, and, you know, we'll continue to monitor what coronavirus does and what that event is going to look like. But we know that regardless, we know how to pull off a sensational and successful gala, even if we can't have an audience in the theater. So I think one of the things we were talking about is maybe looking at, you know, because I think, um, I mean, we all know uh, things have changed. You know, the way we do things, the way we do business has changed probably for the long haul. And, you know, and so I think we've learned a lot in live streaming last year's gala and all of the, you know, we're going to be practicing and learning a lot over the next season. Um, so, but tell us a little bit about the different options, the live streaming options and the in-person options over the next, um, I think we've talked a little bit about that, but, being, but having kind of a hybrid model mm -hmm. uh, for the season. Yeah, I mean, right now, you know, for, for the Artist Lounge live shows, for the, so for the Stevie Wonder show and the Karen Carpenter show, uh, for each one of those, there are six different dates that you can purchase a ticket to live stream that concert into your home beyond the several dates that are available to come see it live and in person. I should also mention, like right now, we cap the theater at 25%. So maximum capacity right now is 130 people. That's the most people that are gonna be in the building. Um, but as far as the gala goes, again, because it was so successful uh, virtually, um, we're probably looking at some sort of a hybrid where we've got a certain amount of people in the theater. And even if and when we get back to complete full capacity, right. We've looked at a hybrid and what that looks like. I don't know. We haven't really settled on the business model of that yet. If it's free to stream still, or if we're going to charge a ticket price to stream, but I don't know why we wouldn't offer some sort of live streaming element to it because we yeah. just saw such tremendous benefit from broadening, broadening our reach the way that we did. And I think the best, like one, for me, one of the best parts of that is that our family members that live across the country were able to actually log on and see what we do. You know, mm -hmm. we've talked about, you know, how great John Mark is or how fun the gala is or, you know, but they were actually able to like have dinner parties all over the, you know, my sister yeah. in Nashville had a, had a party and, and they were able to watch it. And so that, that was really fun. Yeah, I had extended family members, uh, aunts and uncles and cousins who hadn't seen me or Emily perform in years. Mm -hmm. They all were tuning in and there was a text thread going and you know, that part was, was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Well, I want to thank you both for, uh, we're, we're a couple of minutes out and I want to thank you both. Um, I haven't seen you really in person. I haven't gotten to hug you guys in a long time, um, but I want to thank you for getting on and, and I, this was fun. Yeah, this was fun. Yeah, this was fun. So uh, I, I think it was, hopefully it was fun for the, for the audience. Um, I wish I could see your faces on the screen, but we can't. Um, but we really would love to hear from you. Uh, email me at sherry at adplayers.org. Um, go to the survey at the end of this broadcast and let us know about any topics you're interested in finding out about. Um, I can tell you that the next... Uh, mark your calendars, save the date for November 2nd. We're going to have a really interesting conversation with some great 
people. Um, the topic is going to be women in theater. And we're going to be talking to Christy Watkins, our uh, one of our actors and our front of house manager, uh, Emily Tellis-Speck, um, choreographer and director. Uh, we're going to be talking to Jennifer Dean. Um, I think you guys know Jennifer and Emily, don't you? Just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jennifer uh, actually uh, was awarded um, Houston Press's Director of the Year this past year, and so we want to celebrate her. And then we're also inviting Jessica Peterson, who's the playwright for Christmas Shoes. And so we want to talk to them, um, you know, about their experience and, and talk to some strong, smart women. Um, get these guys out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, okay, I shouldn't, I, I don't know if I'm supposed to do this, but I'm going to tease it out ahead. because I've been talking to them about it. Do it. But also look out for December. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do a virtual dueling pianos fundraiser oh, with yeah. uh, Mark Magaha and Patrick Thomas. Patrick Thomas was the amazing piano player and singer from the gala. They're going to be in their homes in Birmingham and Nashville dueling at their uh, pianos virtually on Zoom taking live requests from you, the audience, as they're doing it. So we'll look out cool. for that. It's gonna be a lot look of fun. out for that because we want to encourage, um, you know, we would the same, very similar to what we did for the gala, uh, watch parties and invite your grandkids or, you know, at that point, whoever you're socially distancing with and have a nice Christmas dinner and sing along with us. So it's going to be fun. Um, I'm not sure the date, oh, I, I should have that, but it's, it's going to be the first week of December the first Monday of December. So put that on your calendars. I pitched dueling monologues between Jake and I. <laughs> I, got this. Well, I, I think we prefer Patrick Thomas and John Mark Magaha, I'm just saying. So thank you all again for joining in. Um, again, November 2nd, 6.30 p.m. Uh, we want your feedback and thank you so much. Thanks for being here. We miss you all. all right. We miss you, we miss you. Miss you guys. Thanks.